of the message this morning is Intimidated or Empowered. Let's look at John chapter 20. This is our text for the day. John chapter 20, and this is where Jesus is speaking about receiving of the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, this is Resurrection Sunday, okay? It's still 50 days until Pentecost, but here, Jesus is speaking with his disciples about receiving the Holy Spirit. The context is that Jesus is appearing to Mary Magdalene. And remember Mary Magdalene, she was forgiven much and she loved much. And here Jesus is appearing to Mary Magdalene, risen and alive. Let's pick it up. John 20 verse 14 to 23, reading from the New King James Version, it says, Now, When she, that's Mary Magdalene, had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Can you just imagine for a moment the love that flooded Mary's heart right then because she knew, ah, this is now Jesus. And he's revealing himself, Mary. The joy that must have flooded her heart. Mary, she she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, For I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren. Notice the terminology now after the resurrection. My brethren, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things to her. Verse 19 on the next slide. Then the same day, that's still the Sunday, at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, notice that the doors were shut, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came in and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. Here is the risen Savior appearing and saying, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Imagine that you were there and you actually got to to see the hands of Jesus, 
the nail-pierced hands. You got to see his side. And then is one of the biggest understatements in the Bible. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. I'd like to say that they were ballistic. They were intercontinental. They were absolutely middle wicked, gobsmacked. They were blown away when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What does that last verse mean? Basically, as I understand it, in the disciples beginning to go out and communicate the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, when people would respond and receive the good news of salvation and be converted, then they could declare that your sins are gone. The disciples could declare that. But to people who would reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, the disciples could declare to them, no, your sins have been retained because you have not accepted the good news of Jesus. Now, three points that I wanna share with you. Say three points. Point number one, Jesus is still speaking peace into your situation today. Will you receive it? Please say that aloud with me all together. Jesus is still speaking peace into your situation today. Will you receive it? Let's just look at verse 19 again. It says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them these beautiful words, peace be with you. And then in verse 21, he says the same thing again. He says, peace to you. And I wanna say to you today that I believe that God is speaking those same words to you today. He is speaking those same words. They are just as powerful. And he is saying to you, peace to you. He is saying, peace be with you. Will you receive it? Will you actually realize that this is for you right now in this very moment? And receive it. Or will you just in your head say, yeah, 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 peace, peace, peace. I wanna encourage you, be people where it goes into your heart and you say, ah, oh, Jesus. You are my precious Prince of Peace. I receive your peace. Now, where were the disciples? As you look at that passage, where were the disciples? Well, they were hidden. They were behind closed doors. Some commentators have said that possibly these doors were barred and bolted. Bottom line is they were intimidating and they were hiding. Now, why were they intimidated behind closed doors, barred and bolted and all this? Why? Because of fear, fear of the Jews. That's why they were hiding. I wanna ask you today, and I believe that this is really a word for some people today, in fact, for many people here today. And I wanna say to you, are you hiding behind closed doors? Are you hiding because of fear in your life? You say, John, you don't, you don't understand what happened to me. When I was growing up, I went through the most terrible abuse in my teenage years. I have been so battle scarred and there's so many things that have happened in my life. And yes, John, I am hiding because it's the only safe place that I can find. So I'm hiding behind those closed doors. I'm afraid, I'm fearful, I'm not coming out. But I wanna tell you today that it is not the plan of your heavenly Father that you stay hidden. It is not the plan of your heavenly Father. You might say, John, I've been through a death of a dream. I had a dream of how things would work out. And then my spouse was unfaithful to me. It has wrecked my life. I have no confidence. I'm not prepared to trust anyone again. And I am hiding. And so what if I hide for the rest of my life? I'm hiding. But you know what? You're hiding because of fear. And that is not a good thing, sir, ma'am, that is not good. 
And God is speaking to you even through the sound of my voice today. And he says, I haven't called you to a life of hiding, of fear, of cowardice. I've called you to come out of that and be everything that I have made you to be, but you cannot hide anymore. Come on, somebody's hearing this today. You might be here today and you say, well, I have, I have inferiority, I just feel inferior. Or you might say, well, I struggle with anxiety. I have panic attacks. Uh, it's just, to me, to go to the shopping mall, I get panic attacks. I have to hide. No, you don't have to hide. That's a lie. You might be here today and you say, well, there's been expectations upon my life from when I was young. There was so much pressure from my parents or people around. And because my dad was a medical doctor, everybody felt that I had to become a medical doctor. And I've disappointed the family. And so I'm hiding, I'm hiding, I'm hiding. I wanna tell you, it's time to stop hiding. You might say here today that my business has gone through a terrible time, John. You don't know what it's like. But I wanna say to you, stop hiding in Jesus' name. I call you by the power of the Spirit of God in the name of Jesus to come out of that place of hiding. Listen carefully. The first step to getting out of that hole is to receive His peace. Right here, Jesus comes into their situation behind those closed doors. Jesus is coming into the situations of people, your hearts. He's coming in right now. And He says... He says, peace to you. The first step to get out of that hole, I wanna tell you, is to recognize that the Prince of Peace is giving you peace, which surpasses understanding, and it begins the process of restoration in your life. And so Jesus came right through those doors. How did he come right through those doors? I don't know, but he's God, he can do what he wants to. He came right through those doors and he'll come right through those barriers that you've set up and into the situation and he'll say, peace, peace, peace to your situation. And so will you be somebody who will be intimidated or will you be somebody who will be empowered by God's ability? Even his peace empowers you. Will you be intimidated? Say no, say no, say no. Will you be empowered? God wants to empower you. The first step is to let his peace flow in. And so when your heart is anxious, and sometimes that happens, when your heart is overwhelmed, realize that he is your peace. Number two, see yourself as someone who has purpose and is sent by God. Say that aloud with me. See yourself as someone who has purpose and is sent by God. You see, as believers, we should not allow purposeless living. God does not want his children to be confused about how he wants to use them. Purposeless living is a sad thing. In John 20, verse 21, it says, so Jesus said to them, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Isn't that lovely? You are commissioned according to the scripture. This means that Jesus has commissioned you, he has sent you. So this has to do with purpose. This has to do with identity. And this has also to do with destiny. Jesus mentions the same idea in John 17, and the message translation puts it so well. It's John 17, verse 18, and it says, in the same way, this is Jesus speaking to the Father, in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. Somebody says, well, I don't know what to do in life. I don't know my purpose. I don't know what God's called me to do. Well, firstly, realize that God has given you a mission. And sometimes we need to firstly stop saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, and begin to firstly say what God's word says, thank you, Lord, you have given me a vision, a mission. You have given me a vision, you have given me a mission, and just begin to declare that. Let me say this, in my years as a pastor, I've noticed that many people struggle to understand and to know their purpose. It's actually very sad. There might be many of you that you say, I, I struggle with that. 
And so I don't wanna take away from some of the struggles that people go through in terms of discovering their destiny and purpose. For some, it's a struggle of recognizing and understanding and, and perhaps identifying. For other people, it's a struggle where I believe that even the enemy is trying to steal and confuse your very purpose and to hinder it. And just when you're beginning to follow the purpose of God, all of a sudden, Ishmael's come along the way and things that shouldn't take your attention and you run off to those things. And, and so the enemy, he loves to steal and kill and destroy. If he can steal purpose, that is a terrible, terrible thing. Listen to the statement, it's on your screen. Every year that passes without the believer Discovering their purpose is a tragedy greater than we comprehend. Because every year something's been lost, something's been lost as this discovery is not being made. But nevertheless, despite the struggles that people might be going through to discover their specific purpose, I wanna say to you that God, I believe, he will reveal your unique purpose to you. He loves to speak to you. He tells you of things that are to take place before they take place. And I wanna say to you, you begin to believe that God's heart is to reveal it and that he is revealing his purpose to me, my unique purpose for life. Now, point number three, receiving the Holy Spirit ought to be a priority. Please say that aloud with me. Receiving the Holy Spirit ought to be a priority. And it says in John 20, verse 22, and when he, Jesus, had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So what did Jesus do? Firstly, he steps into the situation of being hidden and he speaks peace to the disciples. Then he says, as the Father has sent me, I send you. Get out of the salt shaker and start to shake your life to influence people. And then the third thing he says is that the Holy Spirit is so important and he breathes on them. He breathes on them. Must have been quite something to be in that room. He breathes on them and then he says these words. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. If this wasn't important, Jesus would not have said it. It ought to be important. On Pentecost Day, Pentecost Sunday today, it ought to be important, the ministry of the Holy Spirit for us. Come on, say amen. amen. It ought to be important. But you know what? I've often struggled with the scripture because this is Resurrection Sunday. And here Jesus is saying, receive the Holy Spirit. But we know according to Scripture that it would only be 50 days later on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would be poured out. I don't know. I'm the only one who's ever struggled with the Scripture. Maybe some of you have as well. And so why was Jesus saying receive the Spirit when it was only going to happen on the day of Pentecost? And so Jesus also said in Luke 24, verse 49, it's on the screen, it says, Jesus said, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So I was kind of thinking, well, what did they get on that day, those disciples there, and 50 days later, what did they get? Was it the same? Was it different? And by the way, I've discovered that sometimes there are theological questions which are difficult to understand. I don't fully understand this. But let me give you three quick possibilities or various views. One view is that some scholars say that Jesus was simply doing a prophetic action and he was releasing in the natural what would later be realized in the spiritual on the day of Pentecost. Another view says, well, they received a foretaste of the fullness that would come on the day of Pentecost. Here's a very interesting one. Another view says, well, these disciples actually received the indwelling or the deposit of the Holy Spirit, and later they would receive the power or the clothing or the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus did say, wait until Jer in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power, endued with power from on high. So there's different opinions 
But you know what? In reality, the different views don't really matter because he has the real issue. Receive the Holy Spirit. That is the real issue. <laughs> and when you and I, as born-again believers today, in this day and age, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we get everything all at once. We get the full package of the Spirit of God when we are baptized by the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? Amen. And John said of Jesus in Luke 3, verse 16, it says, He, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Don't you like that? Oh, say it again, fire. Okay. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I want to say to you today that Jesus is still baptizing people Today, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I want to ask you this question. Have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? Praise the Lord if you have. And if you have, I want to say, let there be a growing desire, a longing for the Spirit of God. May God in this congregation of Choose Life cause the hunger to grow and to develop. 